again, I'm still in my motions. You heard from the last motion how the right questions wasn't asked to my Dr. Harbinson, but I thank him again because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be a healthy man again. And now we hear on Douglas Hansen part, he been missing my court dates for months, months, I'm telling you, months. He been sending in colleagues, you know, it's called repetition, what he done, and he only appear on certain ones, you know. I, I find it unethical for a, a district attorney to to serve for his public in the manner that he served to me. No matter if I wasn't from your pro public or no matter if I wasn't from your community or part of your public, I still had a right to be down there. I, there were shopping malls down there. There were all kind of reasons why I had money on me. And for you guys to say such harsh things towards me, at me, it, it, it really takes a toll on a person. But like I say, I got my God with me and he wants me to get my story out there. And I'm going to do anything and everything to make sure somebody hear the truth about how corrupted y'all system is. You, what a coincidence. On the indictment, there was two officers with no victim or witness. And in these motions, there's the same two cops. When you had a continuance, you said there were going to be three cops. So I'm not understanding how y'all got away with all this misconception of corruption that y'all have done it's a hate crime for sure because I've been hated on by all of you guys you know I had my own information y'all made me do my own legal work stayed up nights and nights and now now you get to hear from two cops one of the cops being Roger Gerald Smith and you see how he gets so fearful because he stutter in saying his own name. And it's funny because they thought that I wasn't going to get these transcripts and expose them. But pick a boo. Roger Smith, in your own words, you said in a police report that Mr. Johnson, which is me, liked to expose people for doing faggot shit. Until me... What you done has fallen into the category of faggot shit because I'm a human being, buddy. And you best to rest assured since you said you're not smart enough to understand what's going on. I'm going to bring light on your world, brother, that uh, you wrongfully did me. And not only that, you remember a time when I was sitting in the hallway when it was all five of your officers. My hands were sweating. My heart was beating fast of anxieties. I thought the world was cl closing in on me. You know, but at the same time, I held my ground. And I went in there and I kept a smile on my face. But deep down inside, I was hurt. I was sweating. My shirt, my undershirt, you could have want, wrung out sweat. It's because I knew you guys were going in there as the credible fake witnesses you are, you know, and that's not fair. But at the same time, that's why this part we have. Now, we, I went through y'all motions. Now it's time for y'all to go through my motions. So when I press play on this, I want you to understand that, you know, I've been digging and digging and digging for dirt on you guys. And what I found out is that you guys are really corrupted. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Thank you. Hold on. Case. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. This is State versus Matthew Mayfield Johnson Jr., 14C42686. Defense counsel Gail Ryder is present with the defendant who is out of custody. Doug Hansen for the state. 
Your Honor, this is the time and date for a continuation of the motion to suppress um, that started last week on the 26th. Um, it's my understanding that the uh, defense had called um, a doctor to testify. Um, right. That was just the brief testimony that was given at that time. Uh, there was cross-examination by the state. Uh, and then we are continuing the motion to suppress as well as deal with some other motions in regards to venue. Um, the state is ready to proceed. We have two officers that are ready to testify. Ms. Ryder, anything further for the record before we begin? Nothing for the record, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Call your first witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. The uh, state calls Roger Smith. If you'd stand right there, please raise your right hand. Under penalty of perjury, do you swear or affirm the information you're about to give in this court and cause shall be the truth? I do, Your Honor. Have a seat. Thank you. Once you're seated, state your entire name, spelling your entire name out for the record. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> uh, my name is Detective Rogers Smith. My first name is R O G E R S. Last name is S M I T H. Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Smith, uh, you indicated you're a detective for which agency? Salem Police Department. And can you tell us how long you have been employed by the Salem Police Department? Uh, it's been a little over nine and a half years. All right. Can you briefly describe some of your training and experience in law enforcement training and what you're doing currently? Certainly. Um, started off my law enforcement career like any, everyone else other go to the police academy. Um, there they have a whole gamut of training from everyday interactions with the public, to DUIs, uh, basic drug investigations, sex assault investigations, domestic violence, uh, regular assaults and thefts, uh, things of that nature. Uh, post academy, um, for two years I was a certified drug recognition expert, uh, knowing the, the signs, symptoms, and physiology and effects of drugs and alcohol, specifically drugs, um, on a person and how it impairs their body um, for uh, drug impaired driving investigations. Um, I've had training on uh, highway interdiction, uh, mostly the, the idea of large amounts of drugs moving up and down the highway and, and how to talk to the driver and discover those in, in control or concealed spaces and traps within vehicles. Uh, further training has been done through uh, the El Paso Intelligence Center. Uh, they're a, a large group of intelligence gathering out of El Paso, Texas. Uh, the uh, Desert Snow or, or Black Asphalt uh, uh, group, which again does like drug interdiction uh, and uh, uh, narcotic type investigations. Uh, I've had training through the Oregon Police Officers Association uh, regarding uh, drug investigations, human trafficking, uh, most recently at the uh, Oregon Narcotic, Oregon Narcotic Enforcement uh, Officers Association in Bend, or, uh, actually I think it was Eagle Crest this past year. Uh, I think that's a, most of it. <laughs> okay. Detective, can you tell us, um, are you currently working at like, um, a unit called like Street Crimes? Yes, sir, I am. Tell us about that, please. Uh, street Crimes primarily focuses on street-level narcotic-type investigations, uh, drug complaints and drug houses. Uh, those, like drug complaints or the drug houses, will come from the schools, come from regular neighbors and citizens. Anyone that sees something out of the ordinary sees a traffic high traffic coming in to and from a house and we'll go out and do a concerted knock and talk, basically knock on the door and see if the individual will allow us in to either find if there's any validity to the complaint or if it's a kind of like a neighbor dispute. Um, <clears throat> past that, we also do, again, like the street level narcotics, uh, individuals are selling small amounts of controlled substances um, and a livability issue. We also focus on human trafficking investigations or prostitution investigations. Um, here in the, the local area where we can go online to certain uh, websites such as Backpage and uh, make contact with females that are involved in prostitution and then uh, make dates with them and subsequently arrest them and, and those involved with those. Uh, Detective Smith, have you um, had an opportunity to uh, do those types of investigations involving promoting prostitution um, during your career? Yes, sir, I have. Uh, and is it common then for you to set up some sort of a meeting, as you said, at a hotel or somewhere local with that potential prostitute? 
Absolutely. Um, did you end up having contact with um, who you became to know as Jessica Johnson in one of your investigations? Yes, sir, I did. And tell us how you first met Jessica Johnson online. <clears throat> On the evening of May 15th, I was looking at Backpage.com. Like as I said, it's a, it's a very common website that uh, women involved in prostitution would use under the escort section. Uh, so is it somewhat like disguised as, as a legal type of a situation as an escort service, but you find in your investigations that it really becomes a prostitution situation? Yes, sir. Okay, go on, please. Looking through that escort section, um, found one ad that was posted uh, on the evening of May 15th, uh, I believe around 4.30 to 5 p.m. that night. Uh, and looking at the advertisement, I could see it was an Asian female, multiple different photographs and uh, various poses and amounts of clothing, uh, limited amounts of clothing. Uh, there was a, a phone number listed there, which uh, using a... Uh, program that we have to send text messages, began a series of text converse, text message conversation with this uh, female uh, in the attempt to elicit a uh, uh, response regarding sexual intercourse or uh, prostitution. So it goes without saying, Detective, that you don't actually tell the person who you are and that you're an officer. Uh, no, actually, it's more often than not, they will ask if we're a cop. Um, are you... Are you affiliated with law enforcement anyway, and it's actually very common for that to be on the ad itself, um, you know, saying that by contacting me, you're entering into a contract in which that you're not involved in law enforcement or the police of any kind, which is also an indicator that there's something not necessarily legal if it's just a simple massage that, yeah. And so tell us then about um, the, the time and and date and place how you set up this meeting with Jessica Johnson. What what was her, what was she known as online? Um, at that point, she was known as Kal Kalina Yamamoto. Um, and I did a little bit of research on her that evening. Uh, there's another website called TNA Board, which is uh, a website for women involved in prostitution and then men that are their clients or Johns, where they can write reviews about one another. Uh, the women that are the, is their term, providers, uh, the prostitutes themselves, excuse me, can go on and look and see what reviews this person has had. And I looked at, I did look that up and she had multiple reviews. Uh, she had a profile listed there with the services that she provides, um, typical times and amounts that she'll allow. Um, that evening on May 15th, uh, we didn't have enough resources available, essentially we didn't have enough detectives to make a, a, a proper investigation and do it safely, and so I had to put it off until the following day. On and how did, how did Ms. Johnson react to that? Um, we had initially set up a date, uh, to and a, a date meaning uh, we'd agreed upon a price, uh, we agreed upon uh, our services. And what were the services that she was providing to uh, you? She told me full service. Full service. During these conversations via text or phone call, it's not going to be, um, will you have sex with me for $150? There will be certain code words or slang such as full service. Full service is a very common term meaning intercourse, full intercourse sex. Is this based on your training experience that you've come to know what these terms mean? Yes, sir. All right. And so what were some of the other terms that she had used? Um, MSOG. What does that stand for? Multiple shots on goal. That is What does that mean? It, it means that during, say, if we're going to be together for an hour, she will allow me to ejaculate more than one time within one hour. As long as I can do it within that one hour time frame, it will be covered under, you know, $100, one hour, I can come as many times as I like. All right. Um, or as I'm physically able to, I guess. Okay. Um, any other terms? Um, may I refer to my report? Absolutely. Do they also talk, and I know this is somewhat crass, but they talk about... How many holes? Yes, they do. Um, uh, Ms. Johnson, her her exact uh, words when I quote, $250 an hour, full service with Greek. The Greek is uh, a very common slang term for anal sex. Uh, or $350 an hour, three holes MSOG. That means for the for the extra the extra hundred dollars making it $350 for the hour, I can do all three holes, meaning both anal 
vaginal and oral, and then I can basically ejaculate as many times as possible within that hour. All right. And so you, um, because of lack of resources or personnel, had to reschedule the time to meet with Ms. Johnson. Did you reschedule that for May 16th of 2014? Um, actually, I didn't reschedule it that night. I left it as, uh, I'll give you a call when I get back into town, when I get back into Salem. And then I didn't have contact with her again that night. However, excuse me, on the morning of May 16th, I noticed that she had reposted a new ad at about 7.40, 7.50 that morning, on the, the morning of the 16th. Seeing that, and it was still within the Salem section, having seen that, I realized she was more than likely still in town, and so I reached back out to her, uh, essentially apologizing for uh, kind of flaking out the day before, and then offering you know, maybe $50 extra to, um, if she would see me and kind of give me a, a second chance. Um, and if she was willing to do that. And you said in the Salem area, um, do, is it common for these women to go from city to city and post at different times and different locations where they are and what they're willing to do? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, even under the, the back page portion of the escort section, you will have at the very top of the page, it will say uh, Bend, Eugene, Corvallis, Salem, Portland. Um, I think there's uh, some of the coast cities uh, there. But you can essentially follow a girl from city to city. And even if you, there's a search section right below where the cities are, you can put in, say, their first name, and it'll bring up any ads that they've recently posted. Or if you can't find something in Salem, I could type in an ad, and it will show me, um, I can't find anything here, but here are some nearby ones. And you can find them, say, in Portland or in Eugene or Corvallis. So when you recontacted Ms. Johnson on the 16th then, uh, was she willing to meet with you? She was. She upped her price, though, to uh, $420 an hour, uh, still for the, the three holes in MSOG. And uh, she said that we had a deal at 1 o'clock. How do you determine where you're going to meet these women? Uh, it can be several different ways. Um, sometimes they will tell you to go to a part of town. Or there, I'm in the Hawthorne and Market area, um, or I'm just in Northeast Salem. On this occasion, I told her that, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you a call around 12:15, and you can tell me where you are. Uh, on this occasion, Ms. Johnson actually said, okay, I'm at the Shiloh Inn on Market Street. So it was very easy for me to find out. She told me exactly what hotel she was at. And so, do you arrange that a specific room to meet her in? How does that work? Again, those most times with that is they will. From my experience, you'll show up in the parking lot and you'll shoot them a text message that says, hey, I'm here. They'll either call you or they'll have you call them um, so that they can actually hear your voice. And they'll do that for a couple reasons. Uh, a lot of times they will have windows that face parking lots so that they can see that you're by yourself or they watch you drive in. They look for other vehicles that are driving in along with you and they see you know, seven, eight guys getting out of a minivan. It's probably a clue that it's not just a normal date. Um, on this occasion, she told me to call her when I got to the parking lot, and when I did that, she told me she was in uh, room 319. Uh, what time of day or night was this? Um, our day was at uh, 1 p.m., and when I called her the final time, it was at 12.53 p.m. Uh, did you arrive by yourself then in a vehicle into the parking lot? I did. Um, we had actually had a, an advance team that went out, several more detectives drove out, uh, about 45 minutes prior. Is that common in these situations it to is. have an advanced team? Yes, sir. And Tell us it, what that team does. Uh, big part of it is, one, to look at the area, see if there's anyone that kind of stands out as a suspicious that maybe is watching the parking lot, uh, that, that looks like they are looking for uh, cops. Uh, also, if we all showed up at once, like I said earlier, you know, one person showing up by themselves and then having, you know, two or three cars or one minivan show up with a bunch of guys, that's a, a clue that, that something is just not right. So we'll have them go out first and usually maybe two other vehicles, and they'll mix into the hotel. Uh, most of the hotels, we have a very good relationship, and they will allow us to borrow room for a, a little bit so that we can kind of stage there. And then when we have the final uh, location to go to, then we'll filter down and, and meet at that room. I assume all the vehicles that you and your advanced team are using are unmarked uh, 
patrol vehicles of some sort? Yes, sir. Uh, you were not in uniform, I imagine? No, sir, I wasn't. Undercover? Yes, sir. How about the advance team? Are they in uniform or not? Uh, typically, they're not in uniform. However, they will you know, take a backpack or some sort of bag that will conceal any of their duty gear or their body armor um, and things like that so that they can try and look as normal as possible when they walk in. So then tell us about um, how you, um, uh, when you first physically met uh, Miss Johnson in the hotel room. Walked up to room 319 and knocked on the door. Um, she answered the door and was wearing little, little to no clothing. She had a fishnet, I, I guess you would call it like a mini skirt or a dress, um, just a one piece item, but it was very, very see-through. She had nothing on the top. Um, Basically, her breasts were bare, uh, other than the fishnet, and she was wearing a, a small pair of, I think, pink uh, underwear. Is this the same woman that you saw in the ads? Yes, sir. Uh, and then did you confirm with her that she was the person you were communicating I with? I did. Um, tell us about your interaction then with Ms. Johnson at that point. Um, I asked her if I could come in, and she stepped back and, and, and waved me into the room. Uh, Is this one, a one-bedroom hotel room? Uh, I believe it was, but I don't remember for sure. Um, I, I don't. Okay. Um, as I stepped into the room, I had my badge in my hand. I identified myself as a Salem police officer, told her she was under arrest. Uh, the remainder of the arrest team uh, had been standing just outside the door and followed me in. Uh, as we walked in, there was a uh, set of closets off to the left, and then uh, like a, a vanity uh, off to my right, and then a single bed. And I was standing between the bed and the vanity when I heard uh, another gentleman from inside the room say, hey, I'm in here, and I saw two hands come out of the closet. All right, and so at this point, how many officers were there, do you recall? Uh, counting myself, I believe it was four of us. All right, and so some of those officers were taking Miss Johnson out because of the arrest, taking her out of the room? Um, actually, I wasn't. I was the one that had uh, control of Miss Johnson. I wasn't able to get out of the room. I was essentially blocked in because the only way out was off to my left now, and that's where the closet was. And so I, I was blocked from exiting. I actually had to go the opposite direction to kind of get both of us out of any potential danger that there was. You didn't know who this individual was that just put their hands out all of a sudden and said, "Hey, I'm here." No. All right. So tell us what happened next. Uh, at that point. Um, Mr. Johnson was found uh, hiding in the closet and was removed uh, at, at gunpoint because we had no idea if he was armed, we had no idea who he was, um, and then he was detained in handcuffs and was escorted uh, towards the bathroom. I uh, placed Miss Johnson in handcuffs and she was escorted to the far end of the room um, and sat in a chair where I began to speak with her. Um, in speaking with Miss Johnson, um, were there, uh, did you gain access to any kind of electronics phones, laptops, anything like that? I did. Um, I asked for and was granted uh, written consent to uh, search her phone and the room and her, and her laptop uh, on a, a consent to search card. Uh, this consent card I read to her verbatim and uh, she signed that card. <clears throat> did you check her phone at that time? I did not. You took it in, to, in as evidence? Yes, sir. I did. So um, tell us then about the dealings with Mr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Johnson was, as I said, walked into the bathroom where Detective Hernandez spoke with him. Um, I really had very little uh, interaction with him. Uh, saw him briefly a few times as we were uh, conducting the investigation. I did most of my talking with Ms. Johnson. And then after that uh, initial interview, uh, I actually began to work on most of the paperwork and writing up the, uh, the arrest documents and things like that. Did you ever have any conversations with the defendant? Very briefly, I believe. Um, at one point, I think uh, when I was talking with Detective Hernandez, at one point there was uh, Mr. Johnson said he had money in his, in his shorts. I think he was wearing like two pairs of shorts, so we had to, to go in and, and get the money from uh, with his consent to remove the money. Did you remember that, or was it Officer Hernandez? Uh, if I remember correctly, sir, give me just one moment. That was, um, that was me, sir. 
and it, it was uh, later found out to be twelve hundred dollars. Twelve hundred dollars in cash. Yes. Sir. That was found on the defendant. Yes, sir. Mr. Johnson. Correct. Do you see that defendant here today? Yes, sir. Can you point him out, please? He's sitting right there. So two from my left at council table. Yes, sir. And um, in uh, so that was the man that Mr. Hernandez, their officer Hernandez, had taken into the bathroom. Uh, and dealt with him at that point. You were still dealing with Miss Johnson. That is correct. Did you later um, have an opportunity to? Well, let me ask you this: was, was there anything else that was found on the defendant that you were aware of? Uh, I believe there was also a cell phone that um, I, I didn't find it personally. Uh, from what I uh, was told, it was found in his hand. I believe at the time he was uh, taken into custody. Uh, but I, Officer Hernandez would have that information. Yes. Sir. All right. Um, were you aware then that did your investigation um, include, in addition to the prostitution situation, any drug activity? Yes, sir. Tell us about that. Um, I talked with uh, Detective Hernandez uh, at uh, one point after he'd been speaking with Mr. Johnson and learned that uh, he had looked through with Mr. Johnson's consent his cellular phone. During those, or, or in doing that, there were text messages that were consistent with him attempting to sell oxys or oxycodone. Is oxycodone a controlled substance? Yes, sir, it is. It's an illegal substance without a prescription? Correct. Okay. Is it legal? If Let's say you, you, you actually have a prescription yourself for those pills. Is it legal for you to then sell those to other people? No. Okay. And so let's um, tell us a little bit more then about the, the, the oxy and then the text messages. The uh, Detective Hernandez told me that there were text messages on his cell phone uh, that were consistent with him reaching out to individuals saying that he had 50 oxys, 5 milligram oxys to sell, and was going to sell them for X amount of dollars. Uh, which, when he told me that, I had noticed in the room there was a bottle uh, labeled or prescribed to Mr. Johnson of 5 milligram oxys, and there were 50 of them within the bottle. So that physical description of what you found met, um, matched exactly with what the text messages said about selling 50 of the 5 millimeter grams. Yes, sir. All right. And talk about, um, if you can, Detective, the, um, the individual, or could you determine who he was talking with in regards to, to trying to sell these drugs? Uh, a gentleman by the name of Nick was the one that was most commonly, uh, uh, the most common messages that were sent. May I refer back to Absolutely. You? Thank you. And while you're doing that, Detective, looking to, to find some of that, um, you did a, a whole scan um, and um, extraction of the cell phones, correct, to help you determine everything that was going back and forth between these people and who owned which phones? Yes, sir. Okay. On uh, Mr. Johnson's phone, so the, the text messages in reference just to the, the oxycodone portion of it, um, dated back to the 5th of May, to a, mostly to a gentleman by the name of Nick, um, several messages to Nick, back and forth. Um, at one point, uh, Mr. Johnson sent uh, this Nick a, a text saying that he need, his sister needs bill money, uh, and that she would have to sell them all for $250. Uh, all 50 of them, all 50 of them for $250. Uh, and the other gentleman was uh, you know, kind of haggling about the price. And that was the last messages were the up to the 6th of May until the evening of May 15th, where uh, a message was sent from Mr. Johnson's phone to Nick at about 7.44 p.m. Uh, asking if he wants to buy some oxys, 5MG, uh, 50 of them for 200, which is actually a, a fairly good deal since they're typically a, a, a dollar a milligram. Uh, 50 of them would, be, would usually be $250, but to get 50 off, you could potentially make profit if you were going to sell them yourself. Um, and so he sent that uh, message to this Nick on the evening of May 15th, uh, and then uh, that was the, the last message regarding uh, the oxycodone or the oxys. Um, Detective, uh, I want to go back a little bit to, to text messages that were sent between 
um, Miss Johnson and the defendant in regards to the prostitution aspect of it, um, does she go by the nickname of, or on the phone, Queen Moneymaker? Yes, sir. Um, and were there verified messages sent between she and the defendant in regards to the meetup with you? I think one of them said, um, I hit a lick for $100. Uh, yes, sir. There was... Uh, <clears throat> I didn't look at the, the message specifically in regards to me. The, there were literally thousands of messages. Um, and when I wrote my report, from that analysis, I, I took small snippets. Um, I would still be typing if I was trying to get them all. Um, the, the sample of these are from uh, Queen Moneymaker. So he cell made listed there is the same a cell list, phone which I called, and he put uh, from text the messages weekend, together, uh, May 15th and May 16th, which made <laughs> sense to him trying to make me be yes, my wife's pimp, uh, and it's say, illegal. Uh, things such as I hit a lick for a hundred, uh, a lick is a more common slang term for a robbery victim. But in this sense, uh, it would appear that they're kind of using it for their own as a, a like a John or a, or a client uh, in this sense. Uh, <clears throat> Did you then, receive information then from in talking with Miss Johnson then and looking through her cell phone uh, and seeing the messages she sent to the defendant? Did you then question her about the defendant's knowledge of what she was doing in his role? I did. And what did she say? She was very vague on a lot of those uh, comments, um, <clears throat> but she would eventually kind of open up that uh, he is there as a, uh, a protection. Um, they had a, a prearranged uh, code signal or code word, such as when a client would get too rough with her, she would say no three times, and that was uh, Mr. Johnson's. This is to far from come the truth. He was hiding, be Why would bed. any man and wait to hear no uh, three Ms. times that there was anything physical to help his wife? This Johnson is just slander from this officer just right here. He never, he would he never ever talked to me. Roger Drill Smith. You hear he stuttered uh, and on his own name. She says, state your whole exact name. And he only gave it Roger uh, Smith. His real name is Roger Drill Smith, for the record. He's never had to hurt anyone. Uh, I never had to hurt no one. Listen, Listen to this man. Listen to this slander. They got somebody else's background on me. And I ain't do nothing wrong. Uh, that... Uh, he drives her to local stores to buy debit cards, uh, the prepaid debit cards, because they don't want to keep their cash on hand, uh, and then they'll they'll retain all their money. That they if have. that's the case, then how did he use the twelve hundred dollars that cards. he found uh, in my pockets? How, if we put it on our debit cards, they never seized our debit the cards. Debit they only that some of the took my the money. Project. They robbed me of my she money, did. which came from my was lawsuit. For that? How, did, how did you describe that? Uh, I don't have the exact words in front of Why do he always got to go back into his notes? He should have been ready for she this. She said that the money was shared. The, the money was shared. She, how? She doesn't... Quote unquote, pay her husband, she, but the money that they earn is shared. She them, don't pay me. According to her. Uh, These people slander me so hard, I can I don't even know what to do. There was no fight in my from, from, side um, of the court because Gail Ryder felt uh, like I was a pimp anyway. Was there for protection, intimidation, and also get some of the proceeds. From How, the when I was extremely sick at the, at the time. There was no right. way I could have helped my wife. She had no, no, way. She had no cash on hand. The only cash that we found was in uh, Mr. Johnson's possession. Um, is it of significance that you found $1,200 on the defendant? For your Actually, it was $1,290 according to the police uh, report. The night before she had met with, uh, two they other they show uh, talk about the $1,200, but they forget I had $1,290. So my question is, where is the $1,290? Where is the $90? Per person, that would be about $800. She said she's been with at least two people. 
So technically, uh, Officer Roger a, Smith offered uh, like that, that uh, Mrs. Mrs. Johnson a fifty Washington extra police. for not being it's there on time. Like so this is a lie. What he explaining? And that uh, that was all in the possession the, of this defendant, not Miss Johnson. That's correct. This is completely lies because I didn't go down there for that. Detective Smith, did you um, have? Um, Look, they so confused. Any opportunity to? Um, well, you, you, it's a collaboration, I guess, between you and the other. Right, a collaboration to, to commit a crime on a poor so black man. With each other to help, they shared um, information. Then, question. But uh, Roger Joe defendant Smith defendant was the leading detective this in this case. Yes. He used uh, information from my wife's prostitution yourself, citation uh, to charge me. So, in other words, he wrote. Information you had obtained from Ms. Johnson, did you share that with Mr. Or Officer Hernandez so he could then question the defendant? Yes. No, that's a lie. Um, they split us up, remember? He talked to one, and uh, Roger uh, Hernandez talked to me. Out of the ordinary? Was he acting weird or different? Not this is that how they're trying to discredit my not, illness. Not of course. They gonna say that they See, cops. They don't wanna. That I, that they don't wanna TV tell the truth about how that. they arrested a sick and poor See, young man. No, they, they wanna they make me out to be like I was out. really, you know, strong and really this intimidating person uh, when I was really you dying. Ended, uh, well, you all of you had ended up collecting the cash. The, the all drugs, of them the collected the cash. The Come on, Johnson, man. Right? Only two and officers went through my court dates. The rest of them was irrelevant. Yes. Okay. Roger Smith is a dirty cop. I repeat, yes. Roger Smith is a dirty cop. Not only that, he's on administrative leave for shooting and killing a minority. The That's why he didn't say Roger Gerald Smith in the beginning. It's off of Market Street? Yes, sir. That's in Marion County? Yes, sir. Uh, and that's where the defendant was located. That's correct. Was that's correct. The drugs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, was there um, an, a, an elementary or vocational? This is where he lie at. Completely lie at. Yes, sir. Uh, room three nineteen, which is on the. Uh, south you see side how he under oath saying me and my wife's room was three nineteen. That's yeah, absolutely yeah. not the truth. Our and room number was four nineteen upstairs. Uh, with the text messages and the pills that were found. Mr. Johnson's truck with delivery of oxycodone uh, being it was within a thousand, it was a delivery within a thousand feet. And help us to understand this delivery concept then. He didn't actually physically deliver anything. On no, I day, didn't. No, correct? I did not. No. Uh, is that called a constructive delivery? Then why am I charged and with a delivery on and my and case? And what's the constructive on my On my record. Why do I got a delivery? Um, this is unethical. Attempting to sell these they keep saying I attempted. Uh, people were reaching out to him. He was actually reaching out to other individuals, offering the pills for sale um, at a reduced price, um, very specific, you know, 50 5 milligram pills um, for this amount. Um, it was not uh, just kind of a random thing. And then in addition, seeing the, the prior messages going back a uh, considerable amount of time, it did not appear to be just a, a one-time random thing that it was um, he was continually and actively seeking out someone to purchase these and it sounds like that particular last message you found that he sent to nick was on may 15th the day before mm -hmm. or that actually that night correct may 15th in the evening correct you don't know where the defendant physically was with that no he do not made that text. why don't you if you did a no, correct I analyst uh, i got a cd show and proof that they uh, lying on me. Black, they own laptop. evidence. Uh, that laptop was identified uh, as Mr. Johnson's. See how they made my wife's laptop mine just to charge me when I had proof from errands saying that it was hers? No wonder why Gail Ryder threw out all my evidence. And it shows me basically a picture of a web page that was recovered. However, our friends have got to do that. These officers is lies, man. Lies. I'm talking about mean, real Pete? thoroughbred uh, liars. <clears throat> they swear under. Oh, they ain't taking their job seriously. And that's exactly why somebody like me is going to take them down. Because they wrongfully convicted me and arrested me, slandered me. Your phone number, whatever narrative that you want to add in your your title. And when you're in the edit mode, 
whoever's doing that is the one that's actually placing the ad that is typing it and, and doing what they want before it's placed onto the web page. And that was uh, this is all I've been correct. doing. Like, screenshot like, showed that the ad was being done. People can't even fathom what I go through so in my everyday life because of this. <clears throat> That's the ad involving Jessica Johnson. Yes, sir. He testified uh, mainly about the what they yes. charged my wife with him for him a prostitution case. And they kept all that information and tried to charge me. His wife as a prostitute. How can they do that? I don't know. They did it. They manipulated, you know, mm -hmm. used certain powers, I you know, kept things. Thank you. Cross-exam. <clears throat> Watch nothing. Thank you, Your Honor. Listen to this fake. She's a yeah, fake, I repeat. Gail M. Ryder is a fake. Sorry, I'm fighting allergies. No, she wasn't. She just didn't want to help me. You actually me. don't know, though. You don't have any information about who was operating or editing that back No, ad they ad don't. Ad no, they don't. Could have been anybody. So why would you blame me? Why would you say it's my computer, no Officer Roger Smith? Uh, offering to sell the oxycodone on May 16th. No, there wasn't. May 16th. No. So how did I get charged? And why was my motions denied? No, sir. Or excuse me, ma'am. No, ma'am, I didn't. That's right. I get that a lot. I apologize. No problem. Okay. Uh, so you don't know where he was transported after he left the. And I told him I was sick. They rushed the bathroom because I was throwing up. Oh, was he? Look, oh, was he? He he knew I was sick. Okay. Cause he took me in the elevator and I told him I was sick. This is ridiculous. Really ridiculous. Did, are you the person who found the oxycodone? Yes, he was. Look what he said. Remember if I, I did find it? I Why you the leading the you the leading detective? Hernan, uh, Roger Smith, you the leading detective, and you gotta look back into your notes. Then you write that you found it in Jessica's purse on your police report. How can you forget that so fast? This how I know they hate me, you know. And this judge let them get away with looking at their notes, but I couldn't produce none of my evidence. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. Would you like to remain or make it? Oh, remain. Remain, Your Honor. So he can, so Douglas Hansen can say we got him at the end. You're doing a good job. They would call Officer Eric Hernandez. Okay. Now he's going to call Eric Hernandez, and this man is a liar, you know. And I'm talking about a liar. He said, "Oh, I know you not her pimp. We just think you get all the money, and that's far from the truth." Again, these 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 officers swore under oath that they were tell the truth and all they doing is lying. Not only that, I got a lot of information to show the world about how I uncovered these people's lies and their corruptions and God knows how many people that these men done prosecuted by the trickery of, of what they doing, you know. I don't have a quiet voice when something is wrongfully done to me. I like to expose it, uncover it, you know, and I like to put it back in y'all face. And I have one man to thank for that. His name is Bostad, R&D Bostad, a, a man that took his time with me from when I was little up until currently. You know, he's... He's been a person that I can call on when when I'm really struggling, when my mind is sick because of this these people. The the emotional roller coaster that I've been on trying to fight without putting on no evidence. The only thing only right that I held on to that they couldn't strip from me was the right to a jury. That's what kept me in the in the in the courts. But now it's like that you see what's really going on. It's like one more officer. This officer, Roger Gerald Smith, did not talk to me. He he interrupted an uh, interview supposedly with me and Hernandez and robbed me from my money because no transaction was made when he entered the room to arrest my wife. There was no form of prostitution. There was no probable cause. I don't, but 
eventually they used my wife as probable cause to arrest me, but you say I was hiding in the closet. If I was hiding in the closet in room 419, not 319 like he testified to, how was I delivering in a school zone within 100 feet? Uh, I like to remind you that when Carrie Weiland was my lawyer, she did have a private investigator by, by the name of Pam. And she testified to me and my wife saying that I wasn't nowhere near a hundred feet, a thousand feet of a school zone, you know, and these people hid out evidence and I need to be exonerated and I'm going to fight for this. And like I said, thank you guys. I know these videos is long and stressful and I thank you guys for watching them for the simple fact that it's educational. And with due time, I might just so happen be that person that changed law behind how they manipulated me and used and abused me and mentally trash my mind you know this is a psychological warfare that i'm facing and to be called names by my own public defender and to be charged for them voluntarily withdrawing is unethical and i when i took my plea bargain now all of a sudden i owe them for money that they robbed me for why take some of my money to pay off y'all taxes that's illegal again i have a check from Willie Merkel, a car collisions lawyer down here, that says that on about around that time I had sixteen thousand some dollars. It was okay for me to take twelve hundred. I could have brung sixteen thousand. That don't make me no pimp, especially for my wife. As you can see, I'm still with her. So it's very unethical. Like I said, I'm probably the first criminal that committed a crime against a supposed victim and got to go home and live with him.